The very boxy Kia Soul has long been a practical subcompact vehicle, but it has never been particularly quick. In the past, you've been able to get it with either a 130 horsepower or a 161 horsepower engine under the hood, but that's all changing for 2017 because you can now get this little hamster with a turbocharged 1.6 liter 201 horsepower engine. You might be a little bit disappointed to hear that that does not turn the Soul into a Kia GTI. It does, however, mean that this is just about the most fun you can have in a vehicle this square. At this point in the video, I should tell you that I own a 2016 Kia Soul. It happens to be a Soul EV, which is the total opposite end of the spectrum from the Soul model that we're taking a look at in this video. From trim to trim, you'll notice that the front end changes on the Soul, whether you get the base model, the mid-level model, the EV, or this top end turbocharged model. As with all modern Kias, we get a variant of their Tiger Nose grill right here, although this section does not actually do any cooling for you. All the cooling is done right down here in this larger grill section. Our model has these large fog lamps down below, HID headlamps, and this signature LED strip that again changes from model to model. At 163 inches long, the Soul is definitely a subcompact vehicle and one of the smaller vehicles you can buy in the United States. This is just about a full foot shorter than a Honda Civic. Despite the stubby length of the Soul, the overall squareness gives us a very practical cargo area and more rear seat headroom and legroom than you'll find in many compact vehicles. Even the compact hatchbacks that are available in the United States typically have a roof line that descends a great deal towards the rear, a very rounded appearance in the rear end. That means that many of those hatchbacks actually have less passenger room and less cargo room than you'll find in the Soul. Because the turbo model is obviously the sporty model, we have this red stripe right down here along the rocker panel, and we get unique wheels and tires. These are 235-45-18s. These are very wide tires for a subcompact vehicle. Out back, we find LED tail lamps. They vary based on the model that you get. We have this body color section right here and a body color Soul logo. Backup camera nestled right there below the Kia logo. You'll find the release for the hatch right here above the license plate. And then we have these large reflectors that mirror the fog lamps up front. Of course, the real differentiator between this and the lesser Soul models are the twin exhaust tips over there on the passenger side. In a somewhat unusual move for the subcompact segment in America, there are now four different drivetrains available in the Soul. Things start out with the base 1.6 liter four cylinder engine that produces 130 horsepower and it is a fairly slow model. You can get that engine with either a six speed manual or a six speed automatic transmission. Then we have the two liter four cylinder engine, which was the top of the line gasoline engine in the past that produces 161 horsepower and 150 pound feet of torque. But now we have this all new 1.6 liter turbocharged engine under the hood. This engine is closely related to the engine that we find in the Hyundai Veloster, as well as the Kia Optima Eco, interestingly enough. It produces 201 horsepower, 195 pound-feet of torque, and is mated to a seven-speed dual-clutch transmission that shifts much faster than your average automatic. It's worth noting that in addition to giving you 40 more horsepower and nearly 50 more pound-feet of torque, this engine also gives you better fuel economy. Of course, if you prefer to drive electric only, there is also the Soul EV, which gives you just over 100 horsepower out of its electric motor and large battery pack. It's important to keep in mind that the turbo version of the Soul is not trying to be a competitor to the Fiesta ST or RS or the Focus ST or RS or the Volkswagen GTI. Instead, this is just giving you more power and better handling than the regular Soul. And the seven speed dual clutch transmission is definitely tuned towards daily driving. That's important to mention because some dual clutch transmissions out there can feel very rough. This is definitely smoother than the Mercedes seven speed dual clutch that we find in the GLA and the CLA. I would say this is actually very comparable to the Volkswagen DSG transmissions. Front seat comfort varies a great deal based on the trim of sole that you get. Because we are driving the top end trim, we have the power driver's seat, the power front passenger seat, and the driver's seat also gets a two-way adjustable lumbar support. Thanks to the amount of headroom, the amount of legroom, and the two-way adjustable lumbar support in our model, I'm gonna give this driver's seat nine out of 10 points. We also have a tilt telescopic steering column with a large range of motion. Because this vehicle has such a boxy upright profile, even though we are in the model with the optional power sunroof, I have about an inch and a half of headroom left up front and the seat is in a more upright position. So I could actually put it a little bit closer to the ground for taller drivers to have a little bit more room. The overall shape of the Soul means that the rear passenger area is a little bit closer to something like a Chevy Trax than a Chevy Sonic. It's really obvious when you take a look at how far my legs are away from this front seat. I have about three or four inches of legroom left sitting right here behind myself at six feet tall. That's because in the Soul, I can sit in a more upright position, more like a kitchen chair style seating position rather than being very reclined. 
That means that even though we have less combined front row plus second row legroom than some compact sedans out there, more usable legroom is found in the sole because that front seat doesn't have to be as far back. In addition to that, I have about half an inch of headroom back here, even though again, our model has the optional panoramic moonroof. If I move over to the middle seat, my head does touch the ceiling in this seating position because it's a little bit higher off the ground than the outboard seating positions. But if I move all the way over to the right side, my knees are not touching the seat. I have about half an inch of legroom left and this front seat is all the way back in its tracks. I had a six foot five person up there that was quite comfortable. In addition to my knees fitting behind the seat, I have no problem actually fitting my feet back here in the footwell because it is very broad and very flat. Helping improve cargo practicality, the rear seats fold flat with the cargo area in the back as long as that cargo area is in the upright position. And a nice touch in the sole is that the center seat belt comes out of the seat itself, not out of the ceiling like we find in some of the Honda vehicles with which this competes. We also have a center armrest with two cup holders. In an unexpected move, the seat belt also unbuckles from its lower tether so you can actually roll that shoulder belt right up there into the seat to make it look a little bit cleaner across the rear bench. Not quite sure why we need to do that because again, the seat belt isn't coming out of the ceiling like we find in some Hondas, but it is kind of a nice touch. The very square profile of the sole means that we can fit more cargo back here than you'd expect. Even though this is one full foot shorter than a Honda Civic sedan, you can fit twice the cargo back here. In fact, the cargo capacity of the Soul, even though this is a subcompact vehicle, is nearly identical to the brand new Honda Civic hatchback. Thanks to the square profile, you can actually fit four of these 24 inch roller bags back here. One right down here at the bottom on its side, these two upright, and this one upright down here in the well. That's because the cargo area is fairly deep. Now, if you don't need to put all these bags right in the cargo area, we can take them all out. All right, like that and then we can actually pull the load floor out of that well and raise it into its upper position, right like that. And if we put the load floor in that position, you can actually put a 22 inch roller bag or a garment bag under the load floor hidden away from view. Under the load floor is also where this practical cargo divider lives. It has three compartments and you can see really how deep it is. In addition to all of this, there's actually room under there for a compact spare tire. Now our model doesn't have one, so we get this can of fix a flat, but if you were to take that out of the way, you could fit even more cargo area down there under the load floor in its lowest position. Because of the overall size of this cargo area and some of the nice touches like cargo tie downs, a 12 volt power outlet, and the fact that the subwoofer doesn't take up any storage room in the back, I'm gonna give this 10 out of 10 points in our exclusive trunk comfort index. As I said before, our model has the panoramic moonroof and you can see it extends just about to the rear passenger's heads right there, well over those rear windows. A nice touch in this cabin is that the shade is completely opaque. It's not one of those semi-translucent shades that we see in some other vehicles. We have high adjustable shoulder belts for both the driver and the front passenger and two-way adjustable headrests. The Soul Exclaim Turbo uses a unique seat design for the Soul. We have this fabric insert right here in the middle leather on the outside with contrasting stitching. We don't find the piping that we find in the Soul EV trim, and we don't find the ventilated seat option that we find in the Soul Plus. Personally, I find it a little bit odd that the ventilated seats are missing in this particular trim because this is essentially the top end model of the Soul. Over on the front doors, we find a majority of soft touch plastics, which is surprising for a vehicle in this category. We have a soft touch insert right here and a soft touch upper portion of the door panel. This is possible because as we work our way from the bottom trim to the top end trim of the sole, Kia actually replaces a decent number of the interior parts. So this is not the same door panel that we find in the base trim. The base trim actually uses a great deal more hard plastic than the model we're taking a look at right here. We of course have storage bins right there towards the bottom of the door. If we zoom in on the speaker grills, you can see that we are in the mood mode for those light up speaker grills. You can also have them flashed in time with your music. The glove box on the passenger side is surprisingly large for a vehicle this size. You can actually fit small boxes inside there because it is quite tall. It's a combination bin style and slot style glove compartment. And you'll also find the cabin air filter inside. Zooming out to the dashboard, you'll notice it is very stylized with a lot of circles. We have the center channel speaker because we are in the top end trim with the top end optional audio system. We also have those tweeters right over there on top of those air vents. Below the center air vents, we find this large eight inch infotainment and navigation system. This is Kia's latest UVO system. We have direct access buttons on the left side to radio media, the UVO screen, etc., And then some additional buttons on the right to take us over to the map, the navigation interface, the phone system, info, and then setup. Because this is Kia's latest infotainment and navigation software, we also get Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. 
Continuing down, we find the single zone automatic climate controls. We also find the heated seat controls because again, our model does not have the heated and ventilated seats. An interesting note here is that we only have two stage heating, whereas some of the trims of the Soul have three stage heating and three stage ventilation. Below the climate controls, we find a storage area without a lid. This is large enough to put a cell phone inside, but as you can see, my iPhone 7 Plus doesn't fit quite in there. Find two 12 volt power outlets, an auxiliary input, and a USB input. Continuing back from that, we have the start stop button for the engine, and then we have a fairly traditional console shifter. The drive is all the way back, manual mode is over to the left. We push away from the driver for up and pull towards the driver for down. We don't find any shift paddles on the Soul Turbo. Between the front seats, we find two large cup holders and a handbrake, which is an interesting touch because we actually find an electric parking brake in certain models of the Soul, but for some reason in the Turbo model, we don't get that electric parking brake. Between the front seats, we have a padded center armrest that opens to reveal a large storage bin where we have an additional 12 volt outlet and enough room to store wallets, keys, that sort of thing. The instrument cluster is a fairly classic Kia design where we have black faces, white numbers, and red indicators. In addition to the tachometer on the left side, we also have a digital readout for the engine temperature. And then on the right side, in addition to the speedometer, we have a digital readout for the fuel gauge. In the center of that, we have a color multifunction display. The functionality of the display differs a little bit based on the trim level that you're in because some trim levels don't have a color display, they have a black and white display. This gives us things like our trip computer information, navigation turn by turn directions, and it allows us to choose certain drive settings. Zooming out from there we find Kia's latest steering wheel design which has sport grips up top and a flat bottom. On the left side of the steering wheel we have the volume controls, track up down mode button, some dedicated phone buttons, and a voice command button. On the right side, we find the cruise control buttons, the drive mode selector that allows us to choose between normal and sport, and then these two buttons control that multifunction LCD in the middle. To the left of the steering column, we find the control for those speaker lights. We can change the mode and we can also adjust their brightness. This is also where you'll find the heated steer wheel button, the traction control disable button, the blind spot monitoring system enable disable, and the dimmer control. There are two important things to keep in mind when we start comparing the Soul Turbo to other vehicles out on the road. The first thing is that this is not trying to be a Volkswagen GTI. The model that we're driving ran from 0 to 60 in 7.2 seconds, which is very, very respectable for this segment. However, a Volkswagen GTI will go from 0 to 60 in 5.75. Something like a Honda Civic Coupe Turbo will do it in 6.6. .6. But this is significantly faster than the Soul with the 2 liter engine. That vehicle ran from 0 to 60 in 8.5 seconds, so this is more than a full second faster 0 to 60. And you can thank not just the turbocharged engine, but also the dual clutch transmission. And the dual clutch transmission is the other thing you need to keep in mind when driving the Soul. Because dual clutch transmissions feel like manual transmissions, because logically they are manual transmissions, they're just shifted by the computer. I realize that may sound a little bit strange to some of you, because you're probably thinking, isn't that what an automatic transmission is? And the answer is no. A manual transmission and an automatic transmission are very different internally. They use very different kinds of gear sets. This transmission internally looks more like a manual transmission than a traditional automatic transmission. So when this vehicle is shifting, it's gonna feel more like a manual transmission. The two main benefits for a dual clutch transmission like this are performance and fuel economy. And this is also why we see that low 7.2 seconds zero to 60. This transmission is much smoother than what we find under the hood of some Mercedes models, and I would say it's very comparable to what Volkswagen offers in their vehicles. It's most noticeable if we're on an incline right like this. It's a little bit hard to tell because, of course, cameras don't really show inclines very well, but this is very smooth creeping up the hill. That's because first gear is very, very low. Now, if you really start creeping slow, then it's going to have to slip the clutch, and it is going to feel a little unusual. The other thing to keep in mind is that we can roll backwards because again, this is a manual transmission. Now the car is gonna try its best to slip the clutch and prevent that, but that's not good for transmission life. So you really shouldn't let the vehicle do that. As I usually say with vehicles that use transmissions that are not standard automatic transmissions, you should definitely make sure you take a good long test drive to make sure it fits your needs and your expectations before you buy it. But this is one of my favorite dual clutch transmissions available. In our braking test, we ran from 60 miles an hour back to zero in 111 feet, which is very short for the subcompact segment and actually short for the compact segment as well. This stops shorter than a turbocharged Honda Civic and about as short as something like an Infiniti Q30S, which is a luxury subcompact vehicle and not direct competition to the Soul. This stopping distance is unique to the turbocharged model because not only do we get those wide 235 with tires that I talked about earlier, but we also have slightly larger brakes than we find in the other versions of the Soul, and that definitely helps not only the stopping distance, but also the fade resistance of these brakes. 
When it comes to handling, I'm going to give this an A- minus or perhaps a B+, plus, depending on what you want to compare this vehicle to. Again, this is not a Volkswagen GTI, so this will not handle like a GTI and it won't handle quite like a Volkswagen Golf either. The reason for that primarily seems to be that the rear suspension in the Soul is not a fully independent suspension, and it is noticeable if you have this vehicle out on winding mountain roads and the road starts to get bumpy in the corners. The rear suspension does feel a little bit more upset than the competition. The reason that Kia does not use a fully independent suspension in the Soul is because of that massive cargo area in the back. Remember, this has a cargo capacity that is very similar to a Honda Civic hatch, which is considerably larger than the sole, and that's all because of the rear suspension design. An independent suspension generally occupies more room in the vehicle, and therefore we wouldn't have a cargo area in the back that is this large. We have that large cargo area, and we have the ability to have a spare tire. We likely would have to have given up one or both of those in order to have a more elegant rear suspension design. To be honest, in most driving conditions, you're not going to notice the design of the rear suspension. It's only going to be noticeable on rough roads if you're really starting to push the sole hard. Compared to other mainstream subcompact vehicles, this holds the road just about as well as top-end versions of the Fiesta or the Honda Fit, but not as well as the sporty versions of the Ford Fiesta. Ford, of course, offers the Fiesta ST, and that's definitely going to outhandle the Soul Turbo. Although Kia says that they have not made any suspension changes for the 2017 model with the turbocharged engine under the hood, for some reason this does feel a little bit firmer than the last Soul Exclaim that we drove. It's most noticeable out on broken roads or out on gravel roads like we're on right here because this does feel a little on the firm side. We're not talking Volkswagen GTI levels of firmness, but it is enough for me to drop this ride score down to B-. Now, it is also important to remember that in vehicles that are this small, and remember we do have a very short wheelbase in the sole, the vehicle can end up feeling like it's bobbing back and forth just a little bit because the wheelbase is so short. That's not unique to the sole. Most subcompact vehicles have that same sort of feeling, especially when the manufacturer puts a firmer suspension on the vehicle. Keep in mind that we also have those 235 with tires that are 45 aspect ratio, and that means that there isn't quite as much cushion from the rubber out on the road, and that could explain some of what we're feeling out here on rougher roads. Back out here on paved roads, the firm suspension is less noticeable than it was out on those rough roads. However, this still does transmit some road imperfections into the cabin. This suspension design is perfectly acceptable for a daily commuter, although for a long highway trip, I might want something just a little bit more relaxed. In our cabin noise score, I'm going to give this a B. We came in at 73 decibels, which was one decibel louder than the last sole that we tested. I think it may have something to do with the tires that are on this particular model. The other main benefit to having a dual clutch transmission under the hood is fuel economy. Even though this is the heaviest version of the Soul, it weighs about 69 pounds more than the 2 liter naturally aspirated version, and even though this is by far the most powerful version of the Soul, this is also the most fuel efficient. We have been averaging between 27 and 30 miles per gallon in this vehicle, depending on how we've been driving it. And honestly, it's a lot easier to drive this vehicle harder than the other versions of the Soul, and that's why we have been getting below the 29 mile per gallon average every now and then. Also keep in mind, I do drive up and over a 2200 foot mountain pass, and that does put a pretty decent dent in the regular Soul's fuel economy. Now this is not quite as efficient as some of the subcompact vehicles that use a continuously variable transmission, but the performance that we get out of this vehicle is vastly superior to those CVT equipped vehicles. And I'm talking about vehicles like the Nissan Versa Note, or the Honda HRV, or the Honda Fit. My bottom line out on the road is that the Soul Turbo is easily the most fun version of the Soul, and it ranks very well in this segment. It's not exactly the most communicative out on the road, it's not necessarily the fastest out on the road, but it is very, very competent, and the 200 horsepower out of this engine really make this more fun than any version of the Soul ever has been. As you'd expect out of a subcompact vehicle in the United States, the Soul starts very inexpensive at $16,100, but the base model is actually better equipped than you might think. We do get that base 1.6 liter naturally aspirated engine, which is obviously the slowest version of the Soul, and a six-speed manual transmission, but we also get air conditioning, alloy wheels, power windows, power locks, Bluetooth, and XM radio, which are features that are typically optional on base models of compact and subcompact vehicles. The next step up from there is the Plus model, and that's similar to what we saw in 2016 for the Soul Plus, that gives you the two liter engine, the six-speed automatic transmission, and an infotainment system with a five inch LCD screen. The key thing to know about the Plus trim for 2017 is that it includes everything that we found in the Plus trim in 2016 and almost everything that we found in the 2016's Exclaim trim as well. So if you want the sort of luxury version of the Soul, that would be the Plus with all of the option packages because now, of course, the Exclaim package is the sporty Soul. 
And that's why the price tag on the exclaim trim has gone up from $21,300 last year to $22,800 starting this year because we get those upgraded brakes, we get the turbocharged engine, and the seven-speed dual-clutch transmission. We also get those 18-inch wheels and the much wider tires than we find on the other versions of the Soul. The 7-inch LCD infotainment system also becomes standard that features Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, or you can opt into the 8-inch color touchscreen system that we had in the model we tested. When it comes to pros and cons, obviously the biggest pro for the Soul is the incredible practicality. It's all because of the very square profile of the Soul and, of course, the way that they've designed everything about the vehicle. The lack of an independent rear suspension obviously falls on the con side of this chart, but the result of using that rear suspension design is definitely a pro because we get that massive rear passenger area and rear cargo area for a vehicle this small. Again, remember that this is more than a full foot shorter than the average compact sedan, yet we get rear passenger room and front passenger room that's more like the average compact crossover. In fact, we find more headroom and more legroom in the Kia Soul than a wide variety of compact sedans and compact crossovers. That practicality is exactly why the Soul has been selling so well in the U.S. The other reason it's been selling well in the U.S. is its reliability. The Soul has been one of the most reliable vehicles in the U.S., and I expect that to continue even with the addition of the dual-clutch transmission and the turbocharged engine. So we're going to put that on the pro side as well. Comparing the Soul is pretty tricky because there used to be two direct competitors to this Kia model. We had the Scion XB, and then of course we had the Nissan Cube. But both of those models are gone, and only the Soul remains in this chunky sort of hatchback meets crossover segment. That means that the Soul lives somewhere between a Mazda CX-3 and a Mazda 3 hatchback, probably somewhere between a Honda HRV and a Honda Civic hatchback. Because we're talking about the Soul Turbo, the first direct competitor in my mind would be the Mazda CX-3. Because the CX-3 is an incredible amount of fun out on the road. But it's fun for a very different reason than the Kia Soul. Because the Soul Turbo is more than a full second faster 0-60 to 60 than the CX-3. But the CX-3 handles very well and has an excellent handling feel out on the road. Which model is right for you depends on how you feel about handling feel versus handling ability versus acceleration. Because when it comes to handling ability, the Kia Soul Turbo, thanks to those very wide tires, actually outhandles a comparable CX-3. But the CX-3 is going to feel more sorted, it's going to feel more connected to the driver. On the downside, the CX-3 is also going to be significantly slower. When comparably equipped, the CX-3 is going to be a little bit more expensive than the Soul, even though it is a little bit slower. Now keep in mind, you can get all-wheel drive in that model. Although the CX-3 is very attractive and we get a few features that we don't find on the Kia, like those LED headlamps and radar adaptive cruise control available, the CX-3 is one notch below the Soul Turbo on my list because we have that very cramped rear seat area and the very, very small cargo area in that vehicle. The loss of practicality and the reduced acceleration performance are what puts that behind the Kia. Helping cement my decision, we have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto available in the Kia. We also have the long standard warranty and I actually think a slightly more premium feeling interior. Next up, we have the Ford Fiesta hatch. The Fiesta starts less expensive than the Kia Soul, but it is a decent amount smaller on the inside. It also is more basic on the inside. But the Fiesta hatch is a good comparison to the Soul Turbo because you can get the ST trim. The Fiesta ST is the all-out performance subcompact vehicle from Ford. Now, 200 horsepower or so may not sound all that exciting, but it is a decent amount more oomph than you get in most subcompact vehicles, and it actually is a half second faster than the Soul. I suspect some of that has to do with the way that the Ford Fiesta ST applies the power and just the overall design of the vehicle. It really is geared more for performance than the Soul is. Remember that at its heart, the Soul Turbo is a faster Soul with a little bit better handling, but they don't really tweak the suspension. And we see a lot more changes from the Fiesta to the Fiesta ST transformation. The 2018 Fiesta ST has already been announced, and it should be just a little bit faster than the 2017 model because it's getting an all-new three-cylinder turbocharged engine. But I don't expect the formula to be that much different. The Kia is still more practical, it's bigger on the inside, it's more comfortable on the inside, especially in the back seat and in the cargo area versus the Ford. It's just not going to be a performance machine the same way the Fiesta ST is. I think the toughest competition for the Soul Turbo is the Honda Civic Turbo hatchback. Honda has finally answered the prayers of car enthusiasts and they're bringing the hatchback version of the Civic to America. In fact, as we're recording this comparison section in this video, we're already driving the Civic Hatchback Turbo. 
Now remember that the Civic hatchback is in a different size category than the Soul. The Soul is a subcompact, the Civic is a compact vehicle. It's really noticeable in the back seat because the Civic's rear bench is much wider than the one that we find in the Soul. Even though we find more real-world headroom and legroom in the Soul, if you put child seats in your vehicle, especially two or three of them, or a mixture of child seats and adults in the back seat, they may be more comfortable in the Civic because of that extra width. The handling in the Civic Turbo is definitely more refined than we find in the Soul, again because of that rear suspension in the Soul. However, when you take a look at the cargo capacity of the vehicle, the Civic only beats the Soul by a very, very slim margin, and the overall cargo area is not as square. The fuel economy win goes to the Civic Turbo thanks to its continuously variable transmission. Unfortunately, the CVT, even though we can get paddle shifters in the Civic Turbo, it's not quite as engaging as the 7-speed dual clutch that we find in the Kia. 0 to 60 acceleration is very impressive in the Honda. Even though their 1.5 liter turbocharged engine produces less horsepower than the 1.6 liter turbocharged engine we find in the Kia, the continuously variable transmission has a positive impact on acceleration, and it will go from 0 to 60 nearly a half second faster than the Kia. When it comes to pricing and you comparably equip the vehicles, they're very well matched in terms of pricing, although the Soul does have about a thousand dollar advantage over the Honda, mainly due to its smaller size. A sport touring Civic hatch would set you back $28,300, about $1,500 more than the top end trim of the Soul Turbo that we were testing. For that price difference, the Civic has LED headlamps, paddle shifters, and dual zone climate control. But the Soul gives you a larger LCD infotainment screen, a longer warranty, a panoramic moonroof, and more headroom. The top end version of the Civic hatchback, of course, includes Honda Sensing, which is their all-encompassing safety package that includes radar adaptive cruise control, lane departure warning, lane departure mitigation, and autonomous braking. We don't find that kind of safety system on the Soul. Of course, the Soul is still less expensive and we have the longer warranty, so even when we adjust for all the feature content, the Soul is still going to be less expensive. The subcompact crossover segment and the compact hatchback and compact sedan segments are all very, very competitive. So it is surprising that the Soul does so well whether you compare this to front-wheel drive subcompact crossovers or compact sedans or compact hatchbacks. If you don't need all-wheel drive, and of course that is a pretty big caveat because the Soul is not available with all-wheel drive, then I would take the Kia Soul over any of the subcompact crossovers currently available in the U.S. It's a better deal than one of my favorite subcompact crossovers, which is the Buick Encore. On the other side of the equation, I think the Honda Civic Hatchback ties the Kia Soul, so I'm going to give both of them my top pick for these two segments. The Civic Turbo is going to be a little bit more expensive, it's going to be a little bit faster, a little better handling, and I think overall slightly less practical in some ways. But the Civic Hatchback benefits from everything that I like about the regular Civic Sedan, only gives you that hatchback form. If you're shopping for a small, fun, practical vehicle, then I would put both the Civic Hatchback and the Kia Soul Turbo high on your shopping list. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Be sure and hit that subscribe button down there at the bottom of your screen so you can be updated on all of our latest videos, including the upcoming video on the Civic Hatchback. You can also find us over at patreon.com if you want to support this channel and over at facebook.com slash alexnautos if you want to see all of the latest daily news. I'll see you next week.